Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of CRA Arthritis. It's ACEs program uh, celebrating and getting information and interviews with some of our leaders in the arthritis community from both the research and clinical uh, perspectives. And today, um, I'm really pleased to have Dr. Nancy Maltez as our guest. Dr. Maltez, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you. Uh, just a brief intro before we get into uh, some of our question and answer, Dr. Maltez, and that's to let our audience know that you're a rheumatologist and a clinician investigator at the Ottawa Hospital, Division of Rheumatology, and a lecturer at the University of Ottawa as well. Um, you joined the team there in 2018 after completing your internal medicine and rheumatology training in Ottawa, and you're currently completing your master's degree in epidemiology at the U of O, and your main clinical and research interests are in scleroderma and specifically Raynaud's phenomenon, which we're going to talk about, um, as well as talk about your podium presentation at the CRA's annual scientific conference. Um, and before we do that, Maybe just some background for our viewers who might be not be familiar with some of the diseases that you are specializing in, and that's maybe to start off talking about scleroderma, and what is it, and uh, what are some of the causes? Mm -hmm. So thank you for having me. It's a huge pleasure to participate in this initiative and uh, even shed some light, an opportunity to shed some light on scleroderma, which is great. And so scleroderma is an autoimmune disease. It falls under the umbrella of rheumatology. And what's important about scleroderma is that it's very multi-system. So we see a wide variety of different manifestations. And what I like to quote is that every patient with scleroderma is completely different because their disease profile can vary significantly from patient to patient. So some patients may have very mild disease and other patients might have life-threatening disease. So I think it's really important to understand that everyone is sort of on a different spectrum than the other. And what I mean by multi-system is it's really multi-system. So usually most patients will have things like Raynaud's phenomenon, which are the color changes at the tips of the fingers, but others can have a gastrointestinal manifestations, including in the esophagus, up to the lung, the kidney, and of course, the muscles and joints can also be involved. And the overarching symptom that we hear is, of course, the skin tightening or fibrosis. So usually starting at the tips of the fingers and then progressing towards um, closer towards the trunk. So that's sort of a bird's eye view of scleroderma. We don't really have a good understanding of what causes scleroderma. There are some hypotheses in terms of whether there's a triggering event or whether some patients are more vulnerable from a genetic perspective. But the truth is we don't really understand exactly what triggers the disease. Um, it tends to be predominantly in females. Um, we see it a bit in the younger population, but again, not everybody reads the textbook, so it can start at any age really, but those that's sort of the demographic we usually see it in. We know how many Canadians are living with it? So there are different estimates of how um, prevalent scleroderma is. I've seen numbers from one in 100,000, um, but we know that there are several thousand Canadians living with scleroderma for sure. And um, with that kind of diversity and range across the spectrum, there must be um, all sorts of different uh, treatment plans for individuals. What generally does that treatment plan look like? Yeah, so as I mentioned, because everyone is so different, every treatment plan has to be individualized mm. to every patient and what their needs are. I think one important thing about scleroderma is that it's really um, multidisciplinary. So scleroderma patients will typically have multiple specialists involved in their care, depending on what type of manifestations they have. So they may have a lung specialist or a gastrointestinal specialist, and we all sort of have to coordinate that care together. Now, one of the themes of this year's conference was health inequities, and we had a number of presentations and a keynote uh, address around that theme at the conference this year. When we look at, I mean, this is a disease, obviously, that is really challenging from a 
a model of care and healthcare delivery. The interdisciplinary aspect, of course, is very interesting and it's part of that. I'm just wondering um, if, if we're looking from a health or through a health inequities lens, um, are there specific challenges for people, you know, black, indigenous people of color um, in terms of getting the model of care that they would need for the for scleroderma? Yeah, so just as in any healthcare system, I think we have certain challenges for sure. Um, I do, I really appreciated the talks at the recent conference. They were really, really helpful on bringing this to everyone's attention. And I think one of the things I retained was that diversity is a fact, but inclusion is a choice. So we have to, you know, even though sometimes it feels like we're doing it subconsciously, even be conscious about making sure that we're, you know, focusing on inclusion as well. I think there are some challenges for some minority populations. First of all, there's a really big need for rheumatology in, in Canada, meaning that there are very few rheumatologists around. Um, so access is a big issue, especially if you live in the rural towns or for the Indigenous, for example, in Nunavut, we do have some um, alliances with uh, Nunavut and we do see patients from Iqaluit and from all over uh, Nunavut as well. So we do try to make sure we reach out to those populations, um, but we're limited by how many rheumatologists are around and, and that sort of access and quarterbacking those um, multidisciplinary teams can sometimes be challenging as well, depending on um, where the patient is living or, or their ability to come to big academic centers. And so some of those challenges are, are specific to certain type, to certain populations for sure. Yeah, I've got one more question and it's around your, your subspecialty, Raynaud's phenomenon and full disclosure, uh, I have uh, I have loved ones in my life who've actually this past Christmas got me some heated gloves for my dog walks and my bicycling because I um, I really suffer from uh, from Raynos in terms of as you said the uh, the the circulation the discoloration of the hand it's it's quite debilitating um, and I haven't actually. Um, done a lot of background research about it. I probably should, but I'm going to take this opportunity just to ask you again. I think it's something that is people are kind of aware of the the name, and they see maybe sometimes their own hands or or toes or their friends that you know turning that white color. It's kind of shocking when you see it. Um, but what actually is Raynos? And I know there's the phenomenon, and, and then I've seen that there's the syndrome. I'm not sure if they're the same. Um, but what is it and um, how, what is the connection in terms of maybe uh, that advancing into more serious uh, complications? Mm -hmm. So Raynaud's is really important. So Raynaud's is, um, we, there are two types of Raynaud's. So there's what we call primary Raynaud's and then there's secondary Raynaud's. So primary Raynaud's typically occurs in younger um, people. And essentially what it means is that primary, means that it's not associated with any autoimmune disease. So it's just something you have. Typically, it doesn't lead to very severe complications. Obviously, it can be painful. There can be some numbness or tingling associated with severe episodes, but we don't get severe complications that patients with secondary Raynaud's get. And what that means is secondary means secondary to another autoimmune disease. So we can see Raynaud's in a variety of different types of autoimmune diseases, including scleroderma. We can see it in lupus as well. Um, so it's sort of across the board can be present. Raynaud's, people will recognize it mostly with the change of color at the tips of the fingers. Usually the fingers will go all white. It can turn a bluish color and then can turn red. Um, but we see all types of different presentations with Raynaud's. And essentially it's affecting the blood vessels. We often refer to the term vasospasm, meaning that there's a spasm in the blood vessel and essentially there's limited blood flow going to the tips of the fingers. And that can be triggered by a variety of things. Traditionally, we hear about it being triggered by the cold. So scleroderma and, and rheumatology clinics can be very, very busy during the winter because the rain notes can be more severe during the cold temperatures. But it can be triggered by other things as well. Even stress can trigger uh, a rain notes attack. 
And so patients have to be a bit cognizant about what triggers it for them and try to um, work around some of those triggers. So the heated gloves are an excellent thing to use. So I applaud you for using those. Yeah, I, I definitely endorse those. <laughs> And then in terms of complications, so for patients with secondary Raynaud's, mm -hmm. um, there are some severe complications that can happen. Uh, those with more minor Raynaud's will get, like I mentioned, pain, tingling, numbness, and it's quite disruptive in that sense. In severe cases where there is such limited blood flow that there's actually damage to the tissues at the tips of the fingers, some patients can get what's called digital ulcers, which are lesions at the tips of the finger that are caused by lack of blood flow to the tips. And digital ulcers are excruciatingly painful and they can be very difficult to treat and require certain types of medications or interventions on an urgent basis. So there's a, again, a bit of a spectrum in terms of those that have minor symptoms and then those that develop complications. So if people do see these symptoms, do you recommend they first maybe talk to their, their they should talk to their family physician about it and just maybe figure out a course of action? Yeah, so we usually recommend that patients mention it to their family physician, and normally that would lead to more questioning about whether there are some red flags or other symptoms that may be suggestive that could be a secondary Raynaud's. And if they feel like there are some worrisome symptoms, they may do some specific blood work to explore that side of things. Um, so I think that's a great place to start. Now, let's um, turn the spotlight um, now onto your podium presentation. And um, uh, I heard a lot of people uh, talking about it. The uh, the comments during uh, during your presentation, I think, um, were really really positive, and people were um, impressed with the uh, the research and findings. I'm wondering if you can, uh, for our audience, uh, translate some of these findings, and maybe or were there any sort of key points or takeaways that patients maybe should be aware of or could benefit from. For sure. So I think there are some key points. So first of all, I was very lucky to be part of this international collaboration where we, um, the Canadian group worked with the French group to get this study up and going. So that was a huge um, initiative and I'm, I'm so lucky to have been part of it. But so essentially we were exploring the use of stem cell transplant. So what stem cell transplant? It's not a, an easy uh, procedure. So it's quite invasive. Um, essentially what we do is we use specialized medications and procedures to collect stem cells from patients' bone marrow. And stem cells are essentially undifferentiated cells that can lead to the production of an immune system. So we collect these naive cells and we then we freeze them we put them aside from the patient themselves and then we use really strong chemotherapy to essentially ablate the immune system so it's almost like an immune system reset and then when patients recover a little bit from that chemotherapy we give them those naive cells back and then they build a new immune system so you can imagine this is not a decision that's taken lightly it's a really big procedure and the other thing that's important about transplant is it's only useful in a very small, narrow subset of patients with scleroderma. So it's only really useful in those that have early disease and that are rapidly progressing, meaning that there's a lot of inflammation happening at that time. That's the window where transplant is useful. So I think that's an important takeaway point that it's not a useful treatment for everyone with scleroderma. It's a very narrow population. And we're lucky in Canada because we have two great transplant centers in Ottawa and Calgary um, that are actively doing these transplants. And essentially, we accept referrals from other rheumatologists that have patients that they think might be good candidates for this type of procedure. And then we decide whether we think they're good candidates. So essentially, what we did for our study is that we don't do transplant quite as often as it's used in Europe, um, where some of the early studies happened. And so what we did is we looked at patients in Canada that had received usual care, meaning with our medications and with multidisciplinary teams, and we compared the, what happened with those patients to patients that were in Europe and that had received stem cell transplantation. So we were able to 
differentiate between both in terms of how, what their outcomes were and how they um, progressed in the following decade after that, that time point. And what we found was that there was an improvement in the skin fibrosis, so the skin thickening. Um, the improvement was better with transplant as compared to the conventional care that patients had received here in Canada. And there was better lung function as well. And the big finding that I think everyone was excited about is that there was some improvement in overall survival, meaning that patients lived longer with the use of transplant than with the conventional care. So these findings are exciting, but I think there's still a lot to learn um, about transplant for sure. We don't really know how well it functions in terms of the gut or um, in terms of the Raynaud's. So I think there's still a lot we need to learn about it. That's, it's amazing research and I congratulate you uh, yeah. on that. And I think um, we'll provide some links at the end here, uh, some general information, but a link to the study as well, if people want to, uh, to see more specific information. Um, I think uh, you talk about how you were lucky um, in terms of the collaboration uh, with France. Well, I think we're lucky too, uh, Ace, that when we attend a, a conference uh, like the annual scientific meeting, we get a chance to meet uh, the leaders, but particularly the next generation of leaders. And uh, it was a pleasure talking to you, to you today as one of the next generation of leaders. We look forward to hearing much more about your work. We're really excited about it. And it's in such a great field in terms of uh, complex disease. Um, that not a lot of people necessarily talk about or are aware of. And so on behalf of our community, um, we wanna thank you uh, for the work that you're doing and thank you for taking the time today to share some of that with us. No, thank you, it was a great pleasure. We look forward to talking to you again, doctor. Thank you. Okay. That's another episode of the ACE at the CRA, CRA Arthritis. And we look forward to speaking with you again talking to another leader from the community and do look for those links at the end of this interview to get more information around Dr. Maltese's work. Bye-bye.